reasons that we're here today. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I have to ask, have, was this the who is seeing this for the first time today? Has anybody seen it? Oh, I'm good. Kind of Great. So who were the repeat customers who saw it already? Better the second time around? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who submitted uh, a question in advance. We actually got quite a few. Some of them are very basic. Some of them go into some incredible detail. Okay. Um, Kids always ask the best <laughs> questions. They do. The some of them overlap, so we're gonna, I'm going to try and sort of uh, put the ones that are have a similar theme together, and then we'll kind of go back and forth. If you guys have questions for Meg, we have um, folks with mics uh, in the audience, so wait for your microphone, and uh, you can ask whatever you'd like. So, Meg, I'm going to start off with the really simple stuff, which you might expect, which was how did you break into screenwriting and slash animation? I, uh, after college, I was a screenwriting major, but then I decided I had nothing to say and I was too afraid. So I became a producer instead, and I ended up working with Jodie Foster for 10 years at her company. Um, but then I kind of started to realize, oh wait, I'm never gonna write anything. And we were talking, my husband and I, about, um, he kind of sat me down and said, you know, do it or stop complaining about it in the most supportive, loving way. Um, and so I did, and I quit, and I started writing, which, you know, as any writers out there know, you write a lot of bad stuff first. Um, every time, by the way, that never goes away. Your first drafts are always bad. Um, and uh, really took what I knew from being a producer into my writing. Um, and because I was taught by an actress and a director, I kind of write from that point of view in terms of emotionally what's happening here, thematically what's happening. So is it different, um, and another question that was submitted in advance, when you're doing specifically writing for animation, um, are you giving, like how much of it is, is your imagination and how much of it is just you waiting to see what they turn it into? It's both. Time? It's both, all the time. Animation is, uh, they don't necessarily at Pixar go after animation writers. They're really looking for writers. They have a, a building full of, of people who can um, come up with gags and, and funny things. Um, so they came to they came to me for structure and theme and character, um, and then of course I also have to be funny uh, and have the jokes. But the um, thing I would say about animation is, and actually my husband is the one who said this to me when I first started working at on Inside Out One, people don't want to animate lips moving, right? They want to animate people doing things, big things. So it's all about behavior. It's all about what characters are doing. And when you do animation, you make the movie eight times, so it takes four to five years to make an animated movie. And they do it in storyboards first. And when, you're pass when they're passing out the, the sequence to the artist to draw, if they don't look happy about drawing it, you can pretty much guess it ain't gonna work. So you really wanna draw some, you wanna write something that would be super fun to draw and yet still have all of that character and theme. Now think about Inside Out, there's three levels. So there's outside with Riley, there's in headquarters, and there's down in the mind, and they all have to talk to each other. So if you do something in this world, it has to echo back up through the other two. So it's a three-dimensional chess that you're constantly playing uh, when you're writing it. The, s the second part to that question was, did they, s which they must have done, but did they surprise you? In it, like, did you see something that you hadn't thought of that they translated into uh, a scene, and can you give an example? Um, the anxiety attack and how they were going to do that, physically draw that, you know, I'm, as the writer you're not necessarily involved in how they're going to manifest that and the way the director created that kind of uh, skittering look in terms of anxiety and the whirlpool, it's just amazing. I think, I think the acting that the animators are doing on the faces is uh, spectacular. Just the smallest nuance in the eyes, you know, the, the artists are the actors because they have to create it on the faces. I think it's, it's amazing. And I, sh I should mention, I should have said this at the top, um, but the news that I saw on Friday or Thursday, this is now the highest grossing Pixar film. I ever. know, crazy. So, <laughs> what you think about it is quite It's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, I do have some other more specific questions, but let's see, does anybody else out here have a question first before? Uh, Come on. Anybody, we have someone raise your hand. How about right there? Wait, wait, wait for the mic. 
So while I was watching, oh wow, there's a loud microphone. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. While I was um, watching the movie, I'd already seen it again. So this time I brought a checklist because I noticed in the first Inside Out, Joy felt every existing emotion. So Joy was sad, Joy was scared, Joy was angry. So I made a checklist for all of the new emotions and the existing ones, and all of them are checked off. <laughs> so I was wondering if that was intentional. That is such. You, uh, kids always ask the very best questions. Um, you know, it was funny when I first came on Inside Out. They were on screening number two, so they had picked their five emotions and they had places to go, but they didn't have a story that was working. And one of the first things John Lasseter said to me is, "Nobody likes joy." <laughs> and the reason is, is because incessantly only happy people are annoying, because it doesn't feel real. Nobody's happy all the time, right? So it starts to I'm feel. No, it's not possible. It literally is not possible. So it was about finding out Joy's psychology, right, in terms of her own, every emotion can't just be their own emotion, that singular emotion every time, because it would get very boring, right? And they are the characters of the movie. So yes, they all have multiple layers to them, which will create those different emotions. Some of the characters like Envy or the more side characters kind of start stay within a certain bullseye. But even them, we have to work very hard to round them out and have them have full... Because I know they're emotions, but they're standing in for the humans, right? So yes, you're right, is my answer. And what was, what was the time... You, said you mentioned it, I think. What was the time of the script for when the film actually... Five years. Five years. Uh, who else has a question? Hi. So um, I was wondering, wonder, wondering <laughs> if there were any like cut ideas in the original script or during pre-planning that didn't make it into the final movie. Oh my God, there's so many. If you're very interested, you can go. There's a book called The Art of, and you're going to see all the art and drawings and characters that never made the movie. Um, and it's a book this thick. Uh, you know, I said you screen the movie internally eight times. That first screening we did, there's almost nothing left in this movie. Uh, it's a very iterative process. You're constantly redoing it. You're constantly, you don't ever, if I've written a script, it's been drawn, we've shown it at Pixar, we get the notes. I never go back to that script. I have to start over at cards. And you have, it gets blown up and blown up and blown up. So it's a very iterative process. So some of the things that aren't in there that I love, but I understand why they didn't make it, is Procrastination Land it was very, very fun. Anger just puts ended up with his feet up watching a TV show. Um, uh, we went to the place where they made facts and opinions, which was fun. Uh, we had a whole bay where the ideas were actually in water, and we had a fisherman named Gail who went fishing for ideas. She didn't make it. The whole first uh, version was all Gail and Joy down in the mine, and then Gail's not even in the movie. Um, and we had a lot of more emotions. We had Schadenfreude, which is a <laughs> about laughing at other people's pain, which felt very teenager. Um, didn't make it. Uh, we had suspicion. We had we and we had guilt and shame, and they were a very big part of the movie originally, um, because there's a big difference. Guilt is something you did, and shame is you are bad. And shame can be very dangerous, actually. And of all the emotions in the research, the one that is actually dangerous is shame, because it's about self-loathing. So she became a very dark character, almost like a kind of dark Disney witch character, but it just didn't fit in with the Pixar, what they were looking for, and, and she started to really pull away from anxiety. And we had started with her, so we went back to that and focused on that and let shame go. Uh, so there's a couple of questions that were submitted which is really about the process. That's I, I'm assuming there must be some aspiring screenwriters in this room. I hope so. I hope so. Um, so uh, aside from the questions they had asked about writing specifically for animation, um, what's what is your like thought process? Like you, you outline, do you and you wrote this with a with a, a partner. Well or I or wrote or, or you wrote and I wrote it and then at the end I went on to write something with my husband in live action and Dave came on. Um, so uh, my process for live animation and live action is the same. Uh, uh, whether I'm working with my husband or working uh, with a director like Kelsey, I always start 
with a lot of conversation and trying to figure out what this is about emotionally because that's what the main character is moving through. So you're looking at Joy as the main character and where she starts and where she finishes. In the first movie, we had drawings on the wall once we figured it out, which is Joy, there was a drawing of Joy keeping Sadness away from the console and then there was a drawing of Joy bringing her towards the console. So now you know the whole movie is trying to get Joy from here to here, right? And how do you do that? So you kind of pick poles of the character and then that's your second act. So it's, but it's always starting with what is that main character realizing? What are, what's coming into consciousness? What's emotionally are they realizing? So in the first movie, it's, oh my gosh, you know, sadness connects us. Riley needs sadness. And in this movie, I think it's two pronged actually. It's about understanding anxiety, but it's also about that belief system and the sense of self, right? And that you can't control your child's sense of self they are their own person. You have to allow them to be as multifaceted as they are as a human because Joy keeps trying to put things in the back of the mind, right? So her movement from putting things in the back of the mind to letting them all out and not having a sense of self that she thinks her child needs to be. It's what her child is and then hugging it, right? Accepting that her child will at the same time believe she's kind and that she's not enough. And that is about for all of us, right? We, we parent ourselves ultimately, right? So it's about that kind of acceptance. So you had someone writing behind you on this. So do you, do you get any, do you get to give feedback on anything he does or is that all Pixar? No, it's Pixar. And there's a director. I mean, it's the director's movie. Uh, this animation's like feature film live action. It's the director's movie. Um, and you're there to service what they're trying to get to. But in order to get there, you have to bring yourself. Do you want to give a shout out to your husband since we've mentioned him a couple of times? Yes, his name is Joe Forte. We're writing together now. He's in the back somewhere. He's in the back. You can wave. <laughs> Where are you, Joe? He's back there. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> He's hiding in the shadow. Uh, who else has a question? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, how about right here on the end? And then we'll go to the back. Okay. Um, so I saw that in the credits, like Lisa Demore and Kristen Neff, um, the psychologist, were credited. So I was kind of curious, like, what degree did you need to do some like extra studying on psychology to write this movie? And I was what you just said about um, appreciating your different emotions. I feel like that I have read some of Kristen Ness's like yeah. self compassion book that definitely yeah. kind of seemed like it could have come from. Yeah. Her. So I'm kind of curious what the balance was, like what um, their role in the yeah, yeah. understanding uh, like developmental psychology. Pixar's was. very big on re research, um, so. We started this movie before the pandemic, but we ended up writing most of it and, and during the pandemic, which means anxiety was very accessible to us. Um, so uh, we saw, met them on Zoom because it was the pandemic. Um, and uh, we just had lots of conversations with them. We had lots of coming back with questions. We had a, a group of teenage girls called Riley's Crew, and they saw every single screening and gave us notes afterward about what was felt authentic and what did not. Um, which at first sounded scary to me, but it ended up being amazing. They were the most prepared. Um, they took it very seriously. Um, so we use the, the, we use, how do I say this? As a writer, you're using the research as a way to focus in on your own experience. Because it's not an intellectual, art is not necessarily just an intellectual experience. It's got to come from inside and that kind of vulnerable human, what on my podcast we call it lava, right? And you have to access that. So you're using the research to drill down into the truth of your own experience and maybe your own blind spots. So when they say, you know, teenage girls, like, and then they'll talk about teenage anxiety and I have to be like, oh my gosh, that's true. I did that at 13. You know what I mean? Like you have to, pull it back into something very real and human and then talk to your director about what he's what's pinging inside of him when they're talking what's making you feel vulnerable what's what feels right and then we can take that into metaphor in the movie because at some point you can hide in research as a writer because it's easier to research than it is to write something and realize it stinks right we all want to write in our heads but when you you know that gap between what you have in your head and what's on the paper is really scary and I think that writers are the people who just keep going anyways. Now that's what I learned at Pixar, because you're around people. There's literally a cabinet full of Academy Awards, 
and you're getting notes from people who have won multiple Academy Awards. And what you quickly realize is, oh, they just kept going. All of their first screenings stink, too. All of them are not good, because that's the process of creation. Like, first drafts are all the stuff that doesn't work and that you're going to start over. So you're using the research for that, but you're always coming back to your own personal experience. Uh, there was somebody in the back, I think, who had one. Thank you. I was going to ask a, a kind of related question because I think there were a lot of people who, who lauded the first film for being accurate in a bunch of ways to the way that psychology had been researched and such. Um, but I imagine there's also a certain responsibility you feel to try and leave people with at least a slightly optimistic view of how their mind works and how they will grow up and and you know if the truth turned out that things were very sad and difficult and didn't get better you probably wouldn't want to make a movie about that and so how do you have you thought a little bit about how you kind of balance this desire to, to portray some of these things in a kind of honest and real way and a responsibility you have to uh, leave people with an optimistic view or leave people feeling really good when they leave the theater you know it being yeah really yeah yeah people. the first movie uh when we did it, it didn't. It pull, It had Riley hugging her parents, and she had that little tear, and then that little smile, and then it pulled out from the window, and then the movie was over. That was in boards. <laughs> but when I went to the bathroom after the screening, everybody was in the bathroom crying, which was great because I knew I wasn't going to get fired. But you know that's not where the movie can end, right? It has to start bring you back and lift you back up to the fun of it, right? Going into cats' heads and dogs' heads and the boy you, you know, that kind of fun because the movie had a kind of heavier but profound moment with the parents, but then it brought you back up. And I think in this movie, in both movies, you have to be careful because like in the first movie, it's easier to explain. Uh, when Riley was on the bus running away, originally we had a darkness overtaking the land in the mind and things were shutting off and going down in the mind. But when you saw it in boards, you were like, oh, that's depression. And that's very, very different than sadness. We can't do a movie about, well, if you just go talk to your parents, you won't be depressed anymore. Like, that's not. So we were like, we can't do that. Oh, my God, we can't do that. So you're, you're always assessing that, like, to be, because we're not mental health experts. We have to be very careful about that. So anxiety is the same. Like, we can't say you don't need medical support if you have anxiety, but we're hoping maybe the movie at least gets you to start talking about it so you can decide your own path. Um, but yes, ultimately it's about entertainment. So the, the movies always do end uh, with the fun, the fun view of it. I, I knew from the beginning, because it's what I do with my anxiety, that I was gonna have, we, I wanted the chair, and that we were gonna ask her to sit down. Because that's how I handled my anxiety my whole life. I imagine a little chair and I say, thank you. I know you're trying to protect me, but I'm not gonna die. So can you just sit over here and watch for a while and let me go into this meeting and pitch my idea? Um, so you're right, but it's something that everybody at Pixar is very, very aware of. And um, like, for example, shame got very, very heavy in terms of being self-loathing. And at some point, the team realized, no, this is not going to leave people with hope. <laughs> it's too heavy. It's way too heavy. I still wish we could have taken it off. But um, so yeah, it's a it's a constant discussion. Everybody on this side, right, right, right over here. Yeah, I'm not a punch-up person, so I once got put into a room as a consultant, and I didn't realize it was a comedy punch-up room, and I was like, <gasps> oh, my God, and I was literally had sweat dripping down my back the entire time because punch-up rooms, they're just comedians, and they just go around and go, okay, this line, let's make it funny, ready, go, funnier, and you have to pitch a line, and I was like, I cannot do this, because they would get to me, and I would be like, well, who is he? I don't. I mean, maybe it's funny because is he, like, always negative, and that's why it's funny, and the director was like, what? What? And I was like, oh my God, I'm in the wrong room. I'm like, I, I, my comedy comes out of character. And by the way, it was like magic 
what the other writers could do. So I'm not dissing that at all. It is like magical how their brains can do that. My brain doesn't do that. I have to know who the character is, what challenge they're up against, what d their default is, right? Like Joy's default is, oh yeah, it'll be fine. You know, that is her default. She's just like, we'll figure it out, right? And then, so uh, I'm working on it from character or from plot problems. Like, I really wanted the character be to be named Ennui. And there was a lot of discussion about that. And so I made it a joke. And then once it's a joke, they don't want to take it out. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, it's funny. Okay, we'll keep it. Um, uh, uh, and then the other prong, which is very, very important to say, is that it is a building full of storyboard artists who are hysterical. Right? So the sarcasm actually came from a storyboard riff where he said, what about a sarcasm? And we were like, oh my god, that's so funny. Right? His version was even bigger and just like it was crazy hysterical if we didn't have time to do it. But um, So those artists are constantly p pitching in too. And then you've got the, these comedians, Jamie Poehler, you know, Louis Black, they're in a booth. So they'll do the lines as written and then they just start throwing, right? Because they are comedians. So some of that will make it into the film. Like in the first movie, uh, The Circle of Sadness, that's Amy Poehler just riffing on the, on the thing. So I can take credit. Uh, there's a lot of people throwing jokes in. Mine are character-based. I could take credit. I know, but I don't. Literally, my publicist was like, start saying the word I. Uh, okay. So I, I, I should probably go to this one because a lot of people asked this one in advance, which was how did you, how did you start? How did you get started with your, with your screenwriting? I decided I, had, I didn't know anything, so I wanted to know, learn about Hollywood, and I decided that my, um, my master's was going to be going to an agency and working as an assistant, which is the center of the cyclone of the business. It's an incredibly hard job. You know, those movies aren't that, uh, you know, at least back then, they, those movies that about being an assistant at an agency are not over exaggerated. Um, people puking in the bathroom, and <laughs> it's crazy. But um, so I became an assistant, and, 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 and then I went and became a producer working for Jodie Foster for 10 years. But I was always doing my own writing on the side until I ca became brave enough to quit and then brave enough to be a terrible writer which I think is really just the key. You have to be brave enough to be terrible at it for a long time because it's a craft. And people, I think because people write emails, they think they should be able to write, right? I don't know what it is where everybody's just like, well, anybody can write. And you're like, yeah, not really. There's a tremendous amount of craft that has to be learned and then you have to find your own voice and then you have to be able to access and you have to be a storyteller. Like there's layers and layers and layers. It's kind of like I say sometimes people are like, if I walked up and handed you a metal rod with a you know, a hot yellow glop of hot glass. And I said, make me a vase. You'd be like, what? I don't know how to do this. It's like 500 degrees and I gotta turn it and I gotta do the thing. And it's like, but so in other art forms, you don't expect that you could just do it. But for somehow with writing, we think, well, we should just be able to do it. And you just can't. And you have to be bad at it. That's why I started a whole podcast. Because you have to be brave enough to be bad at it. A long time. And at Pixar, you're being bad at it in front of 300 people who are giving you notes. Anybody else? In the, in the, uh, right here. Wait, wait for the mic so we can hear you. It's funny because you would think logically that would be what we're doing, but <laughs> we're not. I mean, the building is full of people who are still kids at heart. They just are delighting each other. We're all just delighting each other and trying to make each other laugh. Uh, because, I don't know, somehow to be a storyteller, you're still, you are still have access to that part of yourself. Um, so you don't really think about that. We all love the Pratt Falls and the fart jokes and the, all the fun kid stuff but you're trying to tell the best story. Um, and the first Inside Out, they were a little worried, would kids get it? Would they understand the emotions inside of a head? So they did a special screening. They did a little short film. I think it was Fear on a Diving Board. And they did a little short film about it. No, it was Riley on the Diving Board and Fear Freaking Out. And they brought kids in from of employees. And the kids got it better than the adults. Kids no, get it. It's weird. They really do get it. Much quicker than some of the adults get it. So 
They do care about how many laughs there are, right? They will they will count the laughs, uh, but they don't really. They don't. I said to some the director of Brave, you know that bear sequence was just too scary, man. My kids like jumped into my lap. It was so scary, and he looked at me like, what? You can't say that. It was cool. And I was like, okay, all right. I think we have we have one in the back, and then we'll come down here. Um. Why did you decide to um, add the new emotions instead of just the five? That's a great question. That's a great question. You know, we had to earn that. We had to go to Pete Doctor and tell them how that fit into the world building. Where were they? Did they have access to the panel at all? There was a scene that got cut to talk where you went to the waiting room where the emotions were and you got to see who's still down there and you got to see that they had a blurry version and they had a tiny little button that they could just shoot little things up. Um, and you could see a little spot inside the memory of, oh my God, anxiety was there. There was a tiny little dot inside that ball. Like we did a whole thing about it because we had to prove where have they been? Where are mom and dads from the last movie? And then we had a lot of emotions that we started with. Um, so we had to prove, but for us, it because when you turn into a teen, when you become a teenager, it can feel like all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's different and you feel overwhelmed and you have a lot of emotions going on. So we know that, of course, kids younger than 13 can have embarrassment and, and anxiety, and our idea is they did have a little bit of access, um, but they're coming on strong right now, and they'll recede behind that curtain in mom's head, right, when, as, as they get older. Uh, okay, down over here. Oh, we have one oh, more, yeah. One more then we'll come down here, okay. From the original script, approximately how many rewrites did you have of the script? Well, they showed, th they had eight screenings. You have a rough cut before that, so that's 16. And then, I mean, Dave Holstein jokes, and I don't think he's joking, at seven, he did 75, and he came in the last six months. Uh, so you're hundreds, like, honestly. Like, you're doing so many, so many versions. Like, there's moments where you're like, I cannot rewrite this sequence again. Oh my God, how can I rewrite it again? Uh, but th it is an iterative process, <laughs> lots. I should just say those last two questions just for mimic what we had gotten okay, in advance. Good, so all you right. guys are right on. See you. Well, because sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had a friend who's sad, and your instinct is to say, don't be sad, think about something happy. Uh, we'll fix it, right? You, you kind of get uncomfortable when people are sad, especially when you're a parent. You really want your kids to be happy, so you try to fix it. But from what I learned, the best thing to do, especially for a kid, is just to help them know what emotion they're having so that they understand that's what sadness feels like. Sadness can bring us together and then she passes on versus trying to stop it, right? Trying to get her off the controls. So what you're keen into is at the beginning of the movie, joy is wrong. So as a writer, my job is to fool you. So when you watch the movie, you agree with joy, even though she's wrong. So it's like brainwashing you. So we have a whole, in the first movie, do you remember, there's a whole montage of all the stuff sadness does that we all go, oh, sadness. Remember, she's crying, and they got a drag, Riley's dragging around. And so we had a whole day where we all decided what are some of the things that sadness could do that you would be like, oh, don't do that sadness, and cry at school one, that game. So it was about trying to convince you when you watch the movie, oh, yeah, we don't want sadness on the controls either so that when Joy realizes she's wrong, you can realize that you were wrong too with her, right? But as a kid, you guys have your emotions and they're right there and you feel them and that's what we as adults need to remember, that that's important to have all of them because they all have something to help you, tell you, right? So people say, jealousy's bad, envy's bad. No, of course she isn't, she's a part of you. So envy tells you what you want. And that's really important to know. What do you want? Especially for girls. Right? 
girls are too often told to figure out what everybody else wants. So if you have trouble knowing what you want, a good place to go is what makes you envious. What are you envious about? Why? It's really important that girls are allowed to want and be envious and to have anger too. Right? Girls are allowed to be angry. A lot of times we're told we're not, but we are. It's very important. It puts down a boundary, and boy, do you want to be able to teach your girls boundaries. Because if you're not teaching your girls boundaries, they're, they're going to get into big trouble. Right? So when your kids are little, you have to allow those girls to be angry. It's important. Anybody else? Yeah? How about right there? And then come down here. And then the side, just so we know. These glasses are for di- not for distance. You want to raise your hand. <laughs> I, I noticed that mom's leader was sadness. I know. How come? I'll be honest. The, the dinner sequence in the first film was the only sequence that, that was kept that I didn't write. The, an, an older writer, uh, Simon Rich, r- I believe, wrote that. Um, and it was, a, it was written as a proof of concept because Pete Doctor has this crazy idea that he wants to go inside the head of his daughter and figure out what happened to her joy. And that's how he pitched it. He pitched it. You know what? My daughter, when she was little, she'd answer the door tap dancing and saying, hello, and she was so full of joy, and she loved people, and she loved being alive, and then she turned 11. And then he would show a picture of her like this. And he's like, what happened to my daughter's joy? I want to go in her head and find out. That was his pitch. But they didn't know if it would work visually because they were worried if you're bouncing from head to head, can you know what head you're in? So that's a proof of concept which is why they're all the same sex. And they all look like the person whose head you're jumping into. Because they needed to prove that this would work visually. So that's why. <laughs> um, right here. Hi. Hi. So obviously you were talking about how shame is like an emotion that goes to this one. The five characters, the five emotions that were introduced in this one, were they originally Well, our idea, what we pitched to Pete, because at first he was like, I don't know if this will work world building wise, like where have they been? So we literally drew, they drew the waiting room and, th- and told them where it is. Like, so it was, r- it's right below headquarters. So if it's like that big thing and right below them is the waiting room, but none of those emotions know they're down there. And they're all literally like a doctor's waiting room. They're all just sitting around waiting, reading magazines, waiting to go up. But there's a, there was a control panel with a tiny little button and a screen so that they could have some access, but not a lot, and nobody else knew they were there. So that was our, th- our argument to Pete of, wha- of how you could do it. Um, and I know a lot of people have questions about that. And we did have it in the movie for a while, but it didn't make a final cut. So we believe they did have as- access, right? Of course, kids get embarrassed, kids have anxiety. Um, they just didn't have very much access. Uh, we have time for a few more, but I wanted to ask this one because this is sort of a cliche that everybody asks, which is what's your advice to people who want to screenwriters well I mean this is the most obvious answer but I can't believe how many people don't do it you have to write you don't have to just talk about it and you don't just have to go to to places to learn it you actually have to do it and you have to do it badly over and over and over and over and iterate and iterate and iterate again it's why I started the podcast we have a Facebook group called the screenwriting life where we talk about not just the craft, but the life and what it's like emotionally to do this job. Um, And then we started a Facebook group, which now has like 6,000 writers on it. There's pros on there, there's um, emerging writers on there, and they help each other. They have formed writers group. They all show up at Austin Film Festival, which I highly recommend if you're a writer, because it's all for writers. Um, So it's a really, really big supportive community. And then we started a workshop off of that because people kept asking us for more. So it's just like 20 bucks a month or something, and we've had friends in the business record workshops for you guys to talk about either basics from producer's point of view, from a teacher's point of view, from my point of view. I have a whole workshop on there about creating emotional characters, using belief systems, actually. Um, And then twice a month, we hear pitches to try to help you directly. You can pitch us your story. So they're all just tools trying to help writers 
uh, find their voice, find their story. So once you have that, you've written many, many drafts, 100. Yeah, Michael Arndt says he wrote 100 drafts as Little Miss Sunshine. Once you have your draft, it will get passed around. Hollywood is looking for you. They are absolutely looking for you. But it takes time, and it takes many iterations, and you have to write three scripts 25 times each, just 25 drafts, just to get to that level. And then they will, I believe, that I've, I've seen it happen. They will find you. But people give up. They just give up because you have to fail a lot. And it's hard. It's hard emotionally. Listen. I have a, we're, my, this movie just made a billion dollars, and at the same time, I'm writing a movie in which the producers are like, yeah, we just, we don't get it. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> like, it doesn't, <laughs> this is part of the, it's called creating art. You know, it's not, it's not a craft, it's an art. So it takes a lot of your own emotional investment into it. So my advice is to write and to find your support group who's going to encourage you to keep going. All right, let's take a couple more. Who else? Uh, how about right there? Yeah, uh, right, right on the end there. Right on the end there. This is a practical question. Um, how important then is an agent? Because I hear that they're so important in Hollywood. Some writers say no, they never help them. But <laughs> let's say you have an animation script, Bill. Or it could be animation or realistic. Um, can you get anywhere without an agent, or is you know agents? I mean, I don't know. Don't record this part, but uh, we'll edit it out. <laughs> edit this out. I love my agent, by the way, and my, and he, my husband and my agent. Uh, we love them. We, he's amazing. He's a deal maker. That's what he does, and he's really, really good at it. Right? Uh, uh, it's the producers who are going to find you. Right? Agents just get constantly. They want the, the hot new thing. They want something they can sell, right? They are looking to sell it, right? It's the producers who are going to be on your project from the moment they work with you all the way up to opening day, after you're long gone. Well, if I were you, I would say, okay, what is this genre? Who has made movies that I love that are within this pocket, right? Now, if they're, you know, if it's a giant producer, that's going to be harder. But they're not all giants. There's a lot of independent producers out there, and I would query them about a, with a log line. And they're the ones that are gonna, you know, I got my agent originally because a producer friend is the sent him the script, right? So agents, they're career builders and stuff, but that's once you're in, right? You have to have a little heat on you because you won the Academy's contest, maybe, or some. There's a little heat, then they're gonna come find you, but. I always say go to the producers. A sizzle reel? Maybe if it's good, but it better be good. That's the trick, right? Well, anymore they're not as expensive because, I mean, it's everywhere on the web, but um, it just has to be good, right? We got time for one more, I think, right here. Any skinny on three? I oh, it's so one. funny because I know I did one and two, but I'm either invited to come in and write or I'm not. So that's really up to Pixar, right? They decide. Somebody internally will pitch a three if they think it's sequel. You have to prove it's sequel worthy. Like they won't just do a sequel to do a sequel. It has to be sequel worthy. There has that idea has Can to have be rich enough. In that? No. I was too busy you writing. You the, uh, <laughs> Thank you. You think with the grosses that it's made, it's I know. Would be warranted. Yeah, I don't. Well, I would. I would think it's. I'm gonna. Yes, I would think. But you still have to have the great story, or they're not gonna uh, do well it. Well, before we wrap, you want, you want to just plug your podcast? Or yes, it's called the Screenwriting Life. It's on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, and um, it's about the create the act of creation. So you don't have to be a writer to listen to it. Um, but and we have a workshop called the Screenwriting Life on the Circle site. So. But just come and listen. Come to the Facebook page if you want to. And if you have questions, you can ask that you didn't get answered here or you're too shy to ask. Uh, on the Facebook page, I answer questions all the time. Just say you were here and you didn't get to ask it, and I'll answer you there. All right. Meg, thank you very much. All right. You're I welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.